The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Different pulpit. Please be seated. (laughs) Will you pray, pray with me a short prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Well, church, (laughs) here we are. And what a week this has been. I've heard the question from many people this week, what now? Such a human question after receiving new information in anticipating change after a historical presidential election. And at first, I too was taking in the news and asking that question in my prayers. What now? Knowing that we all think so differently from one another in our nation. And then, I knew that the only answer to this question is that we return to the gospel as we always do every week. We return to the vocation of loving and serving God together. In all that is new around us, this is what has not changed and what does not change, beloved. Our psalm from this morning reminds us of this fact. In the church, what we do and where we come is back together. And that isn't always easy, but we come. We come to water and the word. We come to recall our baptisms into one body and to feast at the table. We come to reflect on the gospel and our calling to discipleship. 
in all of our diversity. We come and we worship God, nourishing our souls for the work of being Christ's hands and feet in the world. And so today, that is what we are going to do. And I feel so privileged to be doing so among a broader coalition of my fellow siblings in faith. As I reflected on the past several years and all that our communities have gone through, a particular memory popped into my mind. A couple of years ago, I got into my car to drive to church early on a Wednesday morning in the season of Lent with a heaviness I couldn't quite put my finger on. And I turned on my radio as I usually do and was met with a wall of sound <laughs> since I forgot I had turned up the music the day prior heading home from work. Can anyone relate? <laughs> Freddie Mercury's voice blasted at me, singing the words, Mama, ooh, I don't want to die. Which was, if I'm being honest, quite shocking, making me laugh on an otherwise groggy midweek morning. I turned down the volume and thought, I'm sure there's something to this. If you aren't familiar, these words come from the famous song Bohemian Rhapsody by the rock band Queen. The song is filled with drama and a range of emotions from deep sadness to anger to playful banter. It is comical to have these words blasting at me so early in the morning on a Wednesday in Lent when we often reflect on Jesus' journey to his own death and resurrection. Mama, I don't want to die. Perhaps it was this odd connection between a song that changed the landscape of rock music, a song that broke all the rules of what was expected, and Jesus, a person who changed the landscape of our world, a life that broke all of society's rules that delighted me. Or perhaps it was just such a relief to listen to a piece of music that was so dramatic so early in the morning in a world that continually has moments of drama leaking at the seams. Or perhaps it was just because I felt just as dramatic as that music that morning. Whatever it was, for the first time that week, my head started nodding to the beat. I rolled my windows down and I sang along with a smile on my face, feeling met by the full range of emotions and the lyrics and notes of this beloved classic. So I turned on the song this week as well, to be met yet again by the tones of this familiar rock opera of the 70s and 80s. The music glides into moments of desperation, utter silliness, nonsense, and towards the end of the almost six-minute journey, a crescendo of guitar leads to these words filled with righteous anger. So you think you can stop me and spit in my eye? So you think you can love me and leave me to die? Oh, baby, can't do this to me, baby. Just got to get out, just got to get right out of here, you know? So, <laughs> I noticed <laughs> that these fun words that I've listened to countless times before are rooted in a protective, righteous anger. And as I sang along, I was reminded of the gifts of this sometimes difficult to embrace emotion. It gives us the power to mobilize a feeling of agency. It protects and inspires it helps us set boundaries, and it is ultimately tied to our lament and care for our world. And this morning, I wonder if these lyrics were similar to the thoughts that were going through Jesus' head as he saw the religious authorities watch everyone donating to the temple treasury in the Gospel of Mark. The story of the widow's might is often a story interpreted as an instruction to give everything we have to God, 
a celebration of a generous spirit, even when we feel like we don't have enough to live with a spirit of abundance. And I, I would say that would be true. But I wonder, does this really make sense as the only reading of this passage in our sacred scripture? There might be something more here. Jesus was just critiquing the religious leaders in the temple for prioritizing their fancy robes over caring for widows. In fact, they weren't just ignoring widows, but actively taking from their ability to be stably housed. Jesus says they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. And just as he turns from the folks with whom he is speaking, he sees a destitute widow attempting to give what little she has to the very folks who have not shown up for her as God commands in the law. In fact, she is giving to the pool of money usually used for charity for folks in need, which clearly is not going to those efforts. And I wonder, if Jesus' words pointing out that the widow gave more than anyone in the temple were said with a tone of righteous anger. I wonder if Jesus spoke in that public space loudly, knowing the religious leaders would overhear him and think about their role in all of this. Imagine Jesus singing these words to the rich folks and the temple leaders milling about him. So you think you can stop me and spit in my eye? So you think you can love me and leave her to die? Oh, baby, can't do this to me, baby. And a chorus of disciples running up behind him as backup singers singing, just gotta get out, just gotta get right out of here. Excuse my silliness, I just can't resist it. Jesus, in this moment, might have used his anger not to destroy or to harm, but to point to the truth and to speak against violence. He digs deeper into the hope that he deeply has, that healing will come to pass for his community trying to find a way. With the help of his healthy anger, Jesus finds a way to communicate hope and trust in God's liberating work in the world. I think sometimes when we are at our most angry, there is a small part of us whispering that if we weren't so angry, we would be deeply sad. This might be a familiar chorus to the rhythm of our lives because there's so much fuel for it. We might be angry that the church is not the same since before COVID lockdown. We might be angry at chronic illness or disability that we experience that has robbed us of a feeling of normalcy in our bodies or relationships. We might be angry at God that we have lost a loved one too soon. Angry at the lack of safety for people living at the margins angry at the lack of affordable housing or that the gender pay gap still exists, angry that in the midst of plague and economic concerns, there is also war. We could go on. We feel righteous anger because we know that a better world is, in fact, possible, that God is calling us all into a path that heals instead of divides, that loves instead of hates, that makes peace instead of perpetuating violence, that provides for the widow instead of taking from her. Our anger is a helper and a friend, a voice pointing us to wisdom within and to the wisdom of God. Now, it took me a long time to realize this, that my anger was not something to be buried deep down within me, 
but that it could be a partner in my own and others' healing. Can anyone relate? Amen. I learned recently that one of my favorite quotes about emotion comes from an American boxing coach. Goes to show I know nothing about boxing. <laughs> in any case, the quote still applies, and it's this. Emotions, particularly anger, are like fire. They can cook your food and keep you warm. Or they can burn your whole house down. Now, sometimes we are afraid that if we feel our healthy anger, it will burn our houses down. That there is nothing good about this emotion or that it would overtake us completely. As a child, like so many other women, I was told that to be a good girl, to be a good woman, and by extension, a good Christian, I was expected to be nice, to not cause conflict, to make myself smaller. But as an adult, I found that being nice all the time was violence in his own way. We need to access both our appropriate anger and our kindness together. To access both holy rage and our gentleness together. Because God has room for it all. To be fully human and present to our work, to our vocation in this world. We make friends with tender rage that leaves room for hope and care for others. An anger that speaks against violence and works towards healing, truth, and reconciliation for all. Jesus' approach to anger tells this to us as well. That our anger has a purpose to clarify what is important, to motivate us to work for change, to even become aware of how we ourselves have been wounded, to inspire us to tell our truth and God's, gathering ourselves together in community to do the work of love in our lives. It also tells us that there is always still hope to be had. Our faith continually tells us that it is not a lost endeavor to live in the hope of a better world. And perhaps, sometimes even having the courage to say our deepest hopes and fears to God and to one another, and to hear one another with compassion in that, is a taste of the kingdom itself. And what if, beloved, what if we say them again and again and again? So much so that speaking out our hope into the world creates the very reality we are all waiting for. In daring to speak what is on our hearts to God and to one another, in the presence of our neighbors, we might see that goodness and justice and our healing and wholeness is right here, ready for the taking. That God is waiting for us to see that our hope is not unfounded, but is revealing a wholeness already here among us all. So, beloved, the next time you feel that sacred burn in your chest and your cheeks calling you to say something, calling you to tell the truth in love and gentleness, take a deep breath and give thanks that your sense of hope and God's love for all people is still alive within you and that you are called to love them in this life too. Amen.